Exactly yeah, right. What was Madam Chang like? Oh, she was a great gal. As I say, she come down there to the flight line, you know, in the hard days and, and talk to us. And uh, uh, she was a uh, and she came back to the states. You know, she's a very charming, well-educated person, and uh, still is today. Her mind's good, and uh, she's old. Got what a hundred and a little over a hundred. But she's, uh, I've got some good pictures with her. Ed Rex and I went over there and she had us a tea and everything for us. And, mm -hmm. and we keep in touch and I'll write letters and she writes the answers to the letters. Do you have any stories about him that you could? No, I, I, only, I have some stories that indicate uh, that uh, what kind of guy he was uh, Can you tell over us there that? during the war. I, uh, for instance, uh, one remark he made, he said, <clears throat> he said, Tex, he said, if you want to teach a dog tricks, he said, first you've got to be smarter than the dog. And that was one of his sayings. And uh, the other one, we went down to Guilin, we were going to move a squadron, and then we flew down to transport, and they hid the transport. And they had a jing bow, and the Japanese fighters came in there. There was nothing on the field, just, just the field. And so they came in, and they put on a real show, doing a lot of acrobatics and buzzing all over the place. And, and there's a, <coughs> an aircraft battery, and we were up there by that, and an aircraft battery up in the mountain. And Chenault was just, boy, he said, man, he, t he told that battery command, he said, why don't you shoot that guy down? And the guy said, oh, if we do that, he said, they'll come by, back here and really beat this place up. And Chenault said, don't you know that if you shoot the guy down, he can't come back? So that's the way his mind worked, you know. And so when I got those guys shot down with me down at uh, Canton with the 51, I called the old man. I said, uh, General, I said, we're not going to be able to beat these guys in the air. This is some new type, but we don't have high airplanes that don't have that kind of performance. He said, oh, he'll touch. He said, don't worry about it. He said, get them on the ground. He said, then you don't have to fight them in the air. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. Chuck Holden and some of those guys went up there and strafed those airfields and, and pretty well cleaned them out. How significant was it in 1991 when the AVG finally got veteran status? In 1991? When they did what? Got veteran status. Oh, it was great, but it was a little late coming, you know. Like Pappy Paxton, the guy I was talking about, uh, <coughs> he died a pauper. And uh, other people uh, the same way because they couldn't get any, had no veteran status. And here's a guy who was in the Navy for a long time. He still they didn't have veteran status, couldn't go to a veteran hospital. And uh, so it, you know, well, they, Better late than never, but uh, finally somebody understood that. The, well, I'll tell you really what happened, though, is uh, they found some documents. Uh, this lawyer uh, found some some secret documents that, uh, that they didn't want another Contra type thing, you know. So when, when those were uncovered, well, they came to the party real fast. Uh, they scramble around and gives instant veteran status and gives a presidential unit citation. And then later on, General Fogelman came down, of course, and gave us all of these things. And, and what about uh, uh, the induction into the uh, U.S. Air Force Hall of Fame? I think that's great. You know, a lot of people are, uh, uh, are recognizing our contribution and uh, and people are out at... Uh, at Midland, we went into that Hall of Fame. We're going into the one up, up there in uh, in um, Dayton. Uh, but we we've been honored at all of these different places around. Gosh, over the years we've been to a jillion places where they've uh, honored us. Is that the ultimate honor, though, being in the Hall of Fame? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a great great honor. That's a great honor, uh, but uh, most of us kind of low profile, you know. We never have gone around. And fourth, that's another thing. Fourteenth Air Force man, they got flying tigers all over the place. Uh, we always would go off by ourselves somewhere, you know. We're like a family. We want to be together, and 
and we've been together for some of us almost 60 years. Like Keaton and those guys, uh, they were classmates of mine at Pensacola, and we went we went through Pensacola in '38, so that's 61 years. And do you think it would have? Uh, I mean, if if Chinook were alive today, do you think this he would have just shrugged it off and said so no, much? No, he'd loved it. Chinook loved our loved us, and we loved him. And and I, I used to fly down and see him when he was in Monroe before he died. And uh, he was so proud of his gardens, and he was there if we could fish, and he was just real happy until this thing really got him, you know, his cancer got him on the lung. He was a chain smoker. And boy, I'll tell you, Anna was sure glad to get the hell out of there. <laughs> All she wanted was out of there. <laughs> How does it make you feel today when uh, the the 14th Air Force Association considers oh, yeah. itself to be flying tigers? Yeah. Well, it's just uh, it's 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 something that nobody's gonna ever change. That nobody's gonna ever change it. So we got to live with it, and so we we uh, we fought it. They could never have done it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, one of our guys that was the original. Uh, kind of organized the AVG uh, after the war, you know, association. A guy named Pappy Paxton, he, he copyrighted that name and the trademark. And uh, they let it slip through the crack because you got to renew it so often. They, and they let it slip through the crack, and that's why we got the problem. Otherwise, they could never use that name. Does it make you angry? Hmm? Does it make you angry? Oh, sure. Sure, yeah. I, you know, we were a unique outfit. Uh, what a lot of people don't understand, we had the, our government had no jurisdiction over us at all. I mean, we worked strictly for the Journalismo. And um, whereas the 14th Air Force, the Americans, they worked for the American people. The AVG only survived how long? Six Six months? Was, uh, was well, some time. of us, uh, yeah, seven yeah. months of combat. Seven, but but rated right a year contract. Yeah, <clears throat> it but it produced an unbelievable amount of aces and unbelievable results. Was there yeah. a lot of jealousy in the military? Oh yeah, well I mean these guys, they, however they were real happy, you know, to see this happen at the time it happened. But uh, then I don't know whether it's uh, jealousy or. Uh, but uh, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't think there's any jealousy, really. Mm -hmm. um, what was but, it? Because we're the, you see, that picture I'm showing you over there. They are our legacy. See, we were the 23rd Fighter Group, and uh, the, the, our guys activated us. So we're very close to the 23rd Fighter Group, which was the 14th Air Force at that time. It was a China Air Task Force. That picture, uh, there's a picture over here where the, the Army Unit uh, 229th Attack Helicopter Regiment, they wanted to use our logo. They were just activating that. And they said, uh, we'd, we would like to carry on your tradition. So we went up and looked at the guys, and they were just a real gung-ho outfit, and I said, that's great. So. Uh, these guys uh, now are flying the Apaches that are over there, and during Desert Storm, the Apaches had the shark's mouth on them and everything, and the A-10s had the shark's mouth. So that's our legacy, and we feel proud to know that somebody would want to emulate us. And uh, of course, that's another thing too, about the use of the name Flying Tigers. If we'd have been a bunch of goof-offs. They wouldn't touch that name with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> I want to ask you, um, Flying Tiger Line, you know, some of the ex-ABG guys put this cargo business together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, a, lot of, a lot of people who left became very successful, didn't they? Like one yeah, became oh, a judge, oh, uh, sure. Ken Jones, that, can you just Yeah, we didn't have a bunch of dummies in this thing. I mean, these guys, uh, we had uh, Moose Moss, he, he uh, Trained Olympic divers. He was very successful, and uh, from Doran, Georgia. And of course, we had the most famous guy of all was uh, 
Gerhard Newman. Uh, Gerhard was a, a crew chief. He came back with the first uh, zero that he had put together. And they were going to deport him, though, because he's a German national. And I called uh, Tommy Corcoran, and, and uh, Tommy Corcoran uh, said, don't worry about it. He, he called somebody, and, and Gerhard got an instant citizenship. And then I wrote a letter for him, and he got his job at GE. And of course, uh, 40 years ago, they had the unveiling of this first supersonic uh, trainer we have, the T-38. And then Johnny Allison and I were down there at the Shindig. Johnny was working for Northrop. I looked at I said, that's Gerard Newman over there. What's he doing here? So he designed the engine that's in that airplane. He later became head of all the power plant division for GE. And he just died here a few months ago. But we had talent, you know, Kenny Jernstead, a senator, uh, got uh, uh, about 12 of our guys were retired Pan Am captains. Uh, and a lot of them, uh, like Catfish Rain and Dick Ross and those guys were flying Tiger Line, retired captains. And so they really were, were not a bunch of dummies in there. Of course, Joe Rodman, uh, another guy, you know, he, he, of course, he flew the hump back with CNAC, but when he left there, he was, he was one of the founders of Flying Tiger Line. Uh, but uh, Joe also became <coughs> president of CAT, which was Sonal's airline over in China. So, and that, you know, that was a big deal. Uh, I mean, they did a lot of good, the airline.